Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we take deep dives into topics at the heart of the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Brandon Johnson to talk about post-scarcity. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED23. All right, Brandon, this is uh, this is kind of a big one. Absolutely. Um, this may be actually... I think this is like the most kind of future facing uh, subject that we've ever tackled on this show besides like the what is the future of transportation going to look like episode that we did uh, a couple years ago. Right. So I'm really excited for this because um, I mean just like like the uncertainty of it all and like the the endless possibilities uh, is you know I'm, I'm looking forward to the future let's just put it that way. Absolutely. There's a lot of social and even like psychological and emotional things tied up in this subject. And mm-hmm. I think one of the things that's most fascinating about it is that, is that we are going to have to rethink how we determine things like our own, both our own uh, economic uh, worth uh, and whether economic activity is a thing that we should, you know, a, a judgment that we should even make as to whether our economic uh, productivity should even be linked to how happy we are. Uh, I'm super yeah, psyched yeah. to dive into this stuff for sure. Yep. So we'll be yeah we'll be getting into several things. First, we're gonna go uh, do a broad overview of what post scarcity is. Um, we're going to talk about some of the driving forces behind uh, post scarcity. So in our case, um, automation. Um, we'll talk about how automation is affecting the workplace, and we'll talk about some steps that are going to need to happen uh, in order for our society to reach this this goal of post scarcity um and what kind of those those like stumbling blocks are and then we'll finish off with uh some specific tools that may be used to kind of usher us into this this brave new world all right so broad overview yeah for sure so uh post a post scarcity economy really deals with this idea where resources are no longer necessarily uh limited so Mm -hmm. for for some definition of unlimited uh right things like electricity and food and water are are in this kind of state where everyone can get by with uh get by and even thrive with what uh what resources are available in economic terms it's usually referred to as it's, it's it comes from like availability of capital but it also comes from availability of like natural resources physical resources stuff like that Mm -hmm. yeah and we have to consider not only like the the um economic price of getting the the resource in question but also like the kind of mental resource right so like it does are people like worrying about how they're going to be getting their next meal or how they're going to be getting their water or whatever um and uh and so so yeah both both the dollar amount that it costs to get the thing has to be minimal and you know the kind of effort that people have to put into um getting it has to be minimal in order for us to count as as post scarcity absolutely yeah um it's important to note that like when we talk about post scarcity we're really talking about low scarcity instead of no scarcity because you know we live in a finite universe uh and so like no scarcity is pretty much impossible uh <laughs> there's always going to be just that you know a little bit of friction at the very least um when it comes to like getting what you need mm-hmm. um We've we've seen periods in history that that you know kind of look like uh, post scarcity a little bit. Um, usually that would be like right after a new technology is invented that like dramatically reduces scarcity for uh, a specific resource. Um, and what usually happens then is that population will rapidly grow until like either that same resource is scarce again or some other resource is scarce. Um, and so that leads us to the conclusion that in order to have like a long-term post-scarcity civilization, um, it's, it either has to be like a relatively young civilization that hasn't, uh, grown enough to like, you know, bump up against some resource scarcity, um, or that civilization has to have like zero population growth, right? They have to be, uh, kind of stagnant in terms of like the amount of total energy that they're, that they're using up. Um, as a civilization um oh by the way the 
this information for this like broad overview um, is mostly coming from a fantastic video that I found on YouTube um, from Isaac Arthur, who tackles like a lot of uh, futurist type um, topics, uh, and I'm I'm really looking forward to like diving into more of more of the videos on his channel. Um, but yeah, so if you if you want like a non compressed version of this, uh, go and watch his uh, like forty minute video. Absolutely. Now, it's tempting to only think about, like, physical resources uh, when it comes to a post-scarcity society. But, of course, humans have a lot of needs that, that aren't fulfilled by, by just, like, physical goods, right? Mm-hmm. And so what we can do is kind of keep in mind the hierarchy of needs um, proposed by Ma- Maslow? Yep. Is that? Yep, that's who it is. Ah, uh, yes. So, so like... As, as we gain more and more resources, more and more of these needs can be met. Um, so it starts, we got to start at the bottom, obviously, with like, you know, the, the food and water and, and shelter that people need to survive. And so, you know, once we, once we are providing those, then we can kind of set our sights on the next, the next tier up, you know, so then we can move on to safety. We have to create a society where people aren't, aren't fearing for either their physical safety or like their like financial safety, right? Mm-hmm. We have to provide a system for people to like um, be able to access a wide and diverse social circle because you know people's like need for belonging is a really really big one, and as we and as we go farther up here, um, we're going to see that like we have we kind of have the tools necessary for these things, but we don't quite yet have like the structures in place Absolutely. to get to like guarantee them right. So like. Given that uh, we live in a world, a connected world, where I can contact like about half of the world's population in an instant, it makes it a lot easier for me to find like a social circle that I'm going to fit into, even if I have like really niche interests. But there's no guarantee that I'll find that, right? So I think I think we still we're we're kind of in between the necessary resources, you know, for people to survive level of post-scarcity and like the kind of mental resources uh level of post-scarcity for sure um and like there's there's another component to this too that i think is really interesting um there's like this idea too that as as we move up the hierarchy of needs we're dealing with things that are almost really like more difficult to for any sort of society to really like provide per se Mm -hmm. particularly and i think a lot a lot of this can come from like an american or a western frame of reference too where this idea of like individual attainment or individualism being so so prominent in the way that we view success and the way that we view a, a lot of these things like love and belonging uh like access to social circles or feeling good about yourself or or feeling like your the things that you do have worth or that or that you're right um finding a purpose in life exactly right it's like well you you know how how much of our like modern western literature is all about these like journeys of self-discovery right um how, mm-hmm. how much of our culture is about things like the hero's journey and um and you know e- even looking at um you know those movies from the 80s uh about like uh st- stories about finding out about finding out things about yourself while growing up it's like oh well these are things that like people quote unquote people can't provide for you you have to find them for 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 yourself so like how do we structure a society that is conducive to these things yeah i think like on a on a societal level um we're still at the at the point where we're like we're kind of trying to figure out how to fulfill the basic needs for everybody Mm -hmm. um and so we we haven't yet like set our sights on how do we fulfill you know the needs higher up the pyramid uh for everybody so i think that's why we still have that kind of mindset that like it's you know it's impossible for me to tell you you know like what your purpose is in life you know it's um it it, it, that's got to be something that you find on your own um and it'll be really interesting to see if that like mindset gets flipped on its head in the future right absolutely absolutely so of course there there's uh you know a few science fiction examples of like supposed uh, post scarcity societies um star trek is is the one that uh, gets cited the most often i think mm-hmm. um you know where they don't have any like currency nobody like has to work um but they just do the jobs that they find fulfilling and uh, i haven't actually like 
gone into Star Trek myself uh, a whole lot, so so I don't know the details of, of the structure of their society. Um, but usually when you see these kinds of things in science fiction, because you know they're being written by people in our current modern society, yeah. th- there ends up being like actual kind of systems where people are you know giving and taking you know or like bartering but they don't call it like bartering they don't call it uh currency you know um <laughs> even though like at, at you know when you get really get down to it it's like okay that's not actually um that's not actually post scarcity yet <laughs> right so here's uh, there's a very interesting thing uh that has to do with this as as I'm pulling this up um so i i don't know i don't know to what degree you've seen star trek uh or particularly older star trek episodes or not but there's this there's this um this culture that um it, particularly in star trek the next generation that's run into a number of times in this case like the, there's not a ton of economic activity among the federation uh the mm-hmm. federation being like the the group that the enterprise is from um but there's this group called the ferengi that are like a uh well, Wikipedia describes them as characterized by their by a obsession with uh, mercantile profit and trade, and their constant efforts to sw- uh, swindle unwary customers into unfair deals. So it's mm-hmm. it's interesting in 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 no small part how this particular group is kind of constructed almost as uh, as a way of demonstrating the ideals of and systems that underlie the the Federation's. Uh, kind of economic system if they're if if one could describe one and i i never really got a ton of closure with that and i think that's by by design mm-hmm. but there's just so much like it's, it's almost cartoonish the way that they're constructed it's it's kind of uh the, the ferengi are almost described and and portrayed as like a, a a race of like mobsters right or folks folks who are kind of trafficking for trafficking's sake which is you know, it's it's de- it's definitely cartoonish, and that you know, but like all TV shows, they don't really age well with the way that they deal with cultural competency. But this that particular group and like Picard's interactions with them uh, are definitely something to check out because it's it's interesting to see uh, that particular thing because the next generation is so like situated after the original series and um, in a particular economic time uh, in the United States. Um, that it's 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 kind of cool to see and i think it it, uh that that's probably one of the one of the most uh particular situations or particular arcs in the series that i think deals with this kind of economic question all right so let's get into some of the specific causes that are that we're facing today that are going to kind of possibly pull us into a a post-scarcity world for sure so Automation is, is has you know been getting a lot of attention um, recently, and I mean it's not like it's not like uh, we have not encountered automation in the past. Um, you know we can go all the way back to like the industrial revolution, uh, you know, and seeing like uh, workers uh, revolting against the concept that these machines that are being built, uh, you know, are, are taking their jobs. But uh, I, I read this fantastic book called "Robots Will Steal Your Job," yeah. but that's okay. By the way. I have a copy of that book that I can give to you if you if you like, uh, dear listener, because it was released under a Creative Commons license. So I can just uh, you know give copies of to, of it to other people. That's awesome. So yeah, so email us at uh, the Nexus TV at gmail dot com if you would uh, like some further reading. So anyway, so he he spends most of the book kind of ramping up, giving the reader the proper mindset to in order to wrap their head around, uh, you know, this whole concept of like how automation is going to affect our world this time around because you know like people like to say that well we've you know we've seen automation happen before and we always find new jobs we create new jobs for those displaced workers to perform you know so if if if, uh, we build a machine that can sew a bunch of textiles uh way way faster than the humans um you know well now there's more jobs as technicians who are going to maintain those uh machines that break down and you know manufacturing jobs to create those machines etc etc but the way that it's different this time is that we're entering a world where there are so many jobs that are going to be 
taken over by kind of general purpose automation. Um, so instead of like machines that do a very specific job on like an assembly line, we're kind of on the cusp of like creating machines that can actually do most of the things that a human does in their in their physical world, but also like in their in their you know creativity and their mental industries that like. A, a huge portion of the population is going to find themselves without work. So let's kind of go through this like point by point. So first of all, obviously, the point of technological progress, the reason that we invent new technologies is to enable us to get the same amount of resources as we could before, but with less effort. And kind of the, the flip side of that coin is we could also get more resources for the same amount of effort. So once we've like kind of created a new technology, it's kind of, you know, up to up to us to figure out which one of those two things we want to do, right? Do we want to have a world where there's less people working uh, and everybody gets like the same amount of resources or do we have the same number of people working but we get more stuff? Mm -hmm. Another really important concept um, to understand technological progress is exponential growth. I think most people you know, if, if I asked them to like draw me an exponential curve would be able to kind of, you know, draw that like hockey stick shape, right? Um, where it's, it seems to be flat at the beginning and then it, you know, uh, curves up to become like almost vertical uh, at the end. But what most people don't realize is that it's really, really difficult to tell like when you're about to hit that explosive growth if you are like one of the one of the entities that's on the curve, right? So the kind of brain exercise that he gives us in the book, um, I'll just I'll just quote it here for you because it's I think it's really really effective. Is imagine an empty glass of water, place some bacteria inside and let them replicate by giving them food. The replication process is such that the number of bacteria doubles every minute. So after 60 minutes, the glass will be full. And since there's no more space to food, for food, the bacteria begin to die and they can't replicate anymore. So the question is, what, per, what percentage of the glass did the bacteria have filled after 55 minutes? So when I first read this, you know, I was like, okay, so, so it's doubling every minute. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to figure it out by starting at the beginning because I don't know exactly how many bacteria are there at the beginning, right? So what you have to do is you have to start at the end of the 60 minutes and kind of work your way backwards from there. So at 60 minutes, it's completely full. At 59 minutes, a minute before that, you know, it will be 50% full, right? Because if it doubles from 59 minutes to 60 minutes, then that means that it's full, right? So you, you kind of have to go divide it by two every minute that you that you go back in time, right? So if you go back five minutes from a full glass, that becomes, how many is that? Two to the fifth power, right? Yeah. Which is... One sixteenth? One sixty fourth. I think it's one thirty second. Oh, okay. It was, it was halfway yeah. between the two numbers I quoted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we go, we go uh, one half and then one fourth, and then one eighth. So that's three steps so far. One sixteenth is four steps, and one thirty-two, one thirty-second is, is five steps. Right, right. So if we take one and divide it by 32, then we get 0 0.03125. So that means that just 3% of the glass is full with only five minutes to go until the glass is full. And so I think that that's just, that's such a powerful like illustration of the fact that like, uh, you know, we might look at ourselves and say like, okay, we're only using like 3% of the available resources here on earth. But like, that means that, you know, if we're, if we're doubling our resource intake every, you know, like uh, year or five years or 10 years or whatever, right? It's only going to take five steps of that increment of time to get to the point where we're using every single resource on the planet. Sure. And the reason that this is important in, in terms of like automation is that we, we, we see that exponential growth applies to things like computer chips, right? So the amount of processing power that we have available for uh, a certain amount of money has been doubling roughly every one and a half years. 18 months is, is the number that I've heard uh, quoted most often. For sure. And just as quoted, it's it started to slow down reportedly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so... So it's it's really difficult for us to kind of conceive currently of where emerging technologies like automation are going to are you know how like how fast those are going to improve in terms of of the you know the the capabilities that it has and and so it's like 
it's really easy to kind of sell things short is basically the takeaway there. So this this whole thing about technology, you know, ever increasing in its in its capabilities and, and exponential growth gets kind of into the subject of the technological singularity as well, which is a, a uh, quite a bit beyond the scope of this uh, podcast episode, but don't worry, we will be doing a an episode of the Extra Dimension later on. Yes. So that that's going to be pretty fun because the technological singularity is the point at which uh, computers become better at designing the next iteration of that computer uh, than humans are at doing that. Um, and so at that point, uh, it technological progress basically becomes too fast for uh regular base humans you know unaugmented humans uh to comprehend so that is a whole can of worms that we'll get into later. absolutely gotta gotta mention my pal my main man ray kurzweil there mm-hmm. yeah because that's that's a huge that's a huge thing a huge thing that futurists have been pr- predicting for a long time and that there are lots of other kind of interesting questions that kind of do almost transcend humanity even in the way that we think of them right now about what happens when we get to that point absolutely Mm -hmm. i'm super psyched for that episode all right so back to the subject of of automation and how it uh how it affects um our our quest for a post-scarcity society so it's it it tends to be much easier to automate like a very specific specialized job than than like to create a robot that can do you know a single robot that can can do everything that a human could do Mm -hmm. which is why we're seeing most of the jobs that are you know kind of the targets of automation uh in this in this early stage are jobs that can be easily kind of like broken down into repeated tasks you know very basic tasks but also we're seeing that uh, a lot of of like the classic example is you know on like a manufacturing line right there's a bunch of like robot arms that are welding and doing you know stuff that that humans used to do but because it's like the same task over and over they do it very well but what we're seeing is that actually like jobs that have to do with like data processing are also very easily automated um so we're seeing things like you know uh, computers that can diagnose specific types of cancer based on uh you know scans from from radiology though you know those are because they have to like look at images over and over and over again and they're looking for like very specific patterns and so it's it, you know now that we have are starting to figure out machine learning it's a lot easier to train these systems um to recognize those patterns very quickly right absolutely absolutely and like the the thing about machine learning and kind of related technologies that's that's tricky to to convey but still kind of obeys this or, or kind of ties in with this is that like machine learning isn't sensing the same things that humans do so it's not it's not mm-hmm. like when, when we say that like for example that like some algorithm is better at determining the whether a disease is present or not in a certain like radiological scan or something like that it's often because it's developed its own internal representation of what what works right um and right. It, and it you know, it's essentially a freak accident, right? That the all all these things indicate to it, and they might map with some, to something that that humans would look for as well. But in many cases, the things that that trigger, particularly a machine learning algorithm, particularly like con- convolutional neural networks, right? These are these are things that essentially generate an internal representation of characteristics of of, of a certain thing that it's classifying for, and it's. You know, more more or less to a human, it would look arbitrary, and that's because compared to our science, like the scientific underpinnings of what we use to diagnose people, or even what we use to like identify things in images in general, not even necessarily in medical uh, medical scans or something like that, we have very different heuristics. Which is it's it's like wild that we have been able to build things that just like totally go contrary to anything that we would ever be able to conceive of like how did we how did we do that (laughs) right 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 so yeah so machine learning when applied to like yeah these jobs that you know humans traditionally do it has a huge advantage not necessarily like right when it starts off but in terms of the scaling up factor right because once once an algorithm has figured out how to do this job we can just you know we can replicate that uh, algorithm many many times and apply it all over the world and so you know it's like one person has learned this thing and immediately that person is doing all of the jobs right which is you know like that's that's totally unprecedented as well 
So basically, there's three outcomes that I can envision here, given that, like, machines can do, like, the jobs that most of us humans do for much, much cheaper. Mm-hmm. And, and those three possible outcomes are, one, automation is going to push humans out of the workforce, but that's okay because we put into place social structures that can support those who are not in the workforce anymore. Number two... Automation pushes humans out of the workforce, and those who own the automation uh, accrue all of the wealth from that system, and the rest of us are just, like, left out in the dust. Which definitely gets into, like, you know, some Marxist, like, owning the means of production versus uh, owning, uh, you know, just the, like, the labor. Right. And number three, humans allow ourselves to be augmented to such an extent that we can compete with the automated machines, right? Or, you know, it's somehow, like, kind of coexist in, in the world with them. Yeah, and that's really fascinating too. That's that's like when when I read over that point as we were preparing for this, I my mind would not have gone there, right? Mm-hmm. My mind would absolutely not have gone to the point where like humans uh like human augmentation uh both like physical and cognitive and psychological, right? Like oh my goodness, that's that's I think that's a, a fascinating area that I have not thought enough about. Yeah, and and if you think about like most of the technologies that we use are essentially like augmentations for that specific task, you know, but they're not like, but they're not like augmentations on the human body itself or on the human mind itself. They're, they're like external augmentations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that, yeah, we're probably going to have to get into like internal augmentations in order to really achieve the same, the same kind of gains uh, of productivity as, you know, like just straight up automated systems for sure for sure and that definitely gets into the technological singularity more as well so we'll kind of we'll we'll set that one aside and we'll discuss that point in more depth in a later episode absolutely absolutely Um, but for now let's talk about kind of the the various ways that the workforce is being changed by all this crazy automation stuff So one of the points that I made earlier is that people quite often say that, you know, like these new technologies, they eliminate some jobs, but they create more jobs in other related sectors. Right. And if we take a look at the latest big like upheaval um, information technology, we're seeing that it eliminates way, way more jobs than it actually creates. And you can take a look at like the the bit the big new multinational billion dollar corporations you know um to kind of see this trend where facebook which is like the youngest enormous company uh on the planet it employs you know like a couple hundred thousand workers and the company is making like many billions of dollars per worker whereas you know as you as you go like farther and farther back companies like walmart or uh, mcdonald's you know like they they employ lots of people, you know, many millions, but they make way, way less money per worker. And and so, yeah, so like the that wealth that's being accumulated isn't being distributed among like a bunch of workers. Right. It's being kind of accumulated by the company itself. And even if it, even if that wealth was being like kind of distributed, like evenly amongst a bunch of workers, that number of workers is still a lot lower now than it was before. Right. Absolutely. And and when somebody is like forced out of their current profession, even if there are other jobs available for them, most times people don't enter a job that is like as satisfying as the previous one or pays as well as the previous one. And it takes a lot of work for somebody to like kind of get retrained into a brand new profession that they haven't done before, um, especially if they've made a career, you know, since like they uh, graduated from high school doing a particular thing. Right. And that's the same reason why like boot camps for, for software development are so huge. And, mm-hmm. and, and there, there are other kind of analogous things in other, in, in other industries as well. But like so many people are transitioning into, uh, into other entire other industries, not just other positions, but, uh, entirely different industries nowadays that like the the demand for programs like that are pretty uh, pretty significant. Yeah. So as as automation kind of takes a hold, um, our middle class is shrinking, which is I'm sure a phrase that uh, people have heard before because that's you know a, a pretty big topic right now as well. Is that many many people who previously you know could uh, could find these these you know fairly well-paying jobs and and have a decent uh, standard of living are finding themselves just kind of out of luck there and so our our middle class is is 
shrinking and uh and you know the amount of people who are kind of getting closer and closer to the poverty line is uh is is growing we have been definitely seeing greater shares of the produced wealth going to those who are already wealthy so that's kind of as you can see kind of we're we're, we're approaching one of those three possibilities faster than the other ones uh and the right. one we're approaching is the I, I would say the least desirable one <laughs> yeah no for sure and here's here's a quote from the book uh, "Robots Will Steal Your Job" and that's okay um, because this like it really spoke to me and it I think that it really succinctly um, kind of wraps the whole thing up. This is one of the many unspoken tragedies of the so-called modern culture: the idea that the greatest aspiration a person could have is to work some mechanical and monotonous job so that they can pay the bills is an insult to the dignity of every individual. Each human being, from the moment they are born, is an invaluable masterpiece, capable of greatness beyond what we can conceive today. To even consider the proposition that we should hang on to an economic system that hinders innovation and automation in order to preserve repetitive and mindless jobs shows the deep loss of perspective and aptitude of our outdated institutions. So yeah, that's yeah, like 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 it, it's our current societal structure kind of dictates that like people's purpose in life is like the job that they have been able to find to sustain themselves right and in so many cases that job doesn't actually like mean anything to the person who's doing it right and so we've built up we built up a culture where it's like people don't like what they're doing they would much rather not be doing it there's you know and especially like if we if we are developing the technology to allow those people did not have to do that job anymore why don't we just let them like not do it like why why do we have to have everybody sustain themselves when we have the means to to you know create all this wealth without any effort and and distribute it to many many people yeah it's just yeah (laughs) right it's it's like um i'm I'm thinking of Right. As, as, as we're talking through this and reading through this, it reminds me of any blockbuster Hollywood movie, right? Mm-hmm. Where there's like some crotchety old dude who's like, you know, in order to, in order to really make it, you know, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And it's like, really, really? Is, is that like, do, do we need people to be adversarial in this sense? Adversarial <laughs> both against other people and, and against kind of against their own, their own kind of desires and what, what makes them feel fulfilled in order, in order to get some sort of weird, perverse idea of fulfillment, yeah. um, it's like, yeah, it, it is bonkers. And I mean, even among people who like you, you ask people, and I, I'm one of these people who'd, who'd say like, I, I really enjoy and am invested in and, uh, and love my work. But like, like the the converse to that is that even really a helpful thing to keep around anymore, right? I mean, like, w- loving what you do is great, but like. Um, that what what you do also brings like is also your main source of income right like mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. that's the thing that we need to 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 get away from and like at, at kind the of risk decouple of going, those two concepts moving back to star trek for a moment there's a uh like one of the things that just blew my mind when i first read like a critique of star Te- star trek from this perspective was that like all of the folks who work uh, for the United Federation of Planets, so all the folks in the Enterprise and whatever are basically just like like that's what they do for fun, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like it's it's what they do as like what we would consider a, a job, right? And they feel like a responsibility to do it, but that responsibility is not tied to their continued existence, right? right. It's not it's yep. not it's not tied to the way that they generate wealth and the way that they're able to eat food and provide for family members or um, stuff like that. Like this is their passion without it necessarily being their occupation. Um, yeah. And so one one question that that has brought up in my mind is that, you know, obviously they, they don't have like an infinite number of, you know, Federation ships for people to, you know, go and work on if they want to. And so like, what is the selection process there of, you know, determining who gets to be on the crew of the Enterprise, right? Right. And, and so like, and, and then this ties into also, you know, that, that uh, hierarchy of needs is like, if you if if the sense of purpose that you had determined for yourself was i want to be like the best freaking 
pilot for these large ships out there and then you're passed over for that you know for that job because you're not as good at it as somebody else like you know how how does the society kind of provide that sense of self-worth that sense of purpose if somebody isn't good enough to do a particular thing and especially if we if we you know bring automation into it is like do we want people to be doing these critical jobs if a machine could be doing it better let alone cheaper right absolutely and i think that's that's one of the biggest things that we haven't figured out about how to operationalize it's an idea like that because mm-hmm. like there's there's the like capability of of determining what makes you happy what makes you feel fulfilled and the like operational guarantee that you will be able to do that right like i, I think yeah you know that there are I think on a macro level, I think that's very that's very difficult to reason about. But on a micro level, for an individual, right? Like I like to to, to face the facts for me. I would prob- I would be happy doing what I'm doing at any number of of places, uh, any number of different types of of organization, whether nonprofit, for profit, or in even in a different industry than the advertising industry. Mm-hmm. But I I like where I am because I. I know the kind of developer they're looking for, and I know the perspective they're looking for that kind of for that kind of person, uh, that right. kind of somebody to fill that role. And like on a micro level, I personally could reason about that very well. But I think on a macro level, right? Like if I wanted to be a pilot per se, which like being a pilot would be pretty darn awesome. Uh, yeah. But I am uh, kind of easily distracted or easily <laughs> lulled into. Uh, yeah, so it's like I, I would be an awful pilot, but if I want to be a pilot, my option for that is to, I don't know, go take classes and become a hobbyist pilot, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. then, then these things become hobbies and not, um, not things that like you do all the time, right? Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not like a competitive cyclist, but I love biking. Um, yeah. I think I think it's that it's that same sort of thing. Like, I, you, not not to say that you can be like if you decide that your passion is like being a doctor, you can't be like a hobbyist doctor. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of a problem. Um, but um, it, it's a it's a know. little bit tempting to just say like, well, let's stick all these people who want to do things that they can't realistically do in uh, you know some virtual reality where they think that they're you know doing them and making a difference and stuff, uh, but they're actually not. Um, but that solution feels a little bit dystopian to me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, there and you know there might be some way to still derive value from that, mm-hmm. um, right? Like you you learn all of the different ways that like a surgery could go horribly wrong if you have a bunch of amateur doctors perform, <laughs> performing it and knowing how the human body reacts in VR and you're like, oh no, this person, this is this is a goner. So like then you can alert a surgeon. You're like, no, you're mm-hmm. doing, you're going the wrong way, friend. <laughs> I have heard, uh, you know, some some kind of detractors to to the automation argument saying that, like, you know, well, it's it's not going to eliminate all jobs. And they'll cite, you know, some examples of of like jobs that reasonably probably are not going to be automated. But like the point is that in order for us to hit a massive societal upheaval, uh, we don't actually need to eliminate that many jobs you know like the the great depression was uh you know what like 30 percent unemployment or something like that and you you know if we just like look into the short-term future here like 45 percent of jobs in the united states are either like in the transportation industry or like working retail right and those are some of those those low-skill jobs that are ripe for uh automation um, what with uh, automated uh, vehicles on the horizon and, um, you know, self-checkout lines are already a thing. So we're reducing the number of like cashiers that we need very rapidly. Amazon already has like entire physical stores where you walk in, grab some stuff and walk out and uh, and you, you don't have to interact with any employees at all. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. For real. I think like another component of this too is like uh, where this where this percolates and how, how this kind of moves out. I mean, because of course, Amazon's main kind of locations for that sort of thing are in Seattle and yep, maybe, of course. maybe in Portland too, right? Um, which are two relatively major cities. Um, I, I, I don't think I would be incorrect in calling them major cities. And as a result, most of the people who, who shop at places like that are who, who have the um the the means to to even go to go to shops like that and purchase from shops like that are probably mostly amazon employees so like that the way that these 
that these innovations are currently rather like um, cyclical, right? So Amazon creates a store that's shopped at by people who live in the Seattle area, and many of the people who live in, in the Seattle area um, work for Amazon or Microsoft, though clearly not all of them, right? But like, no, <laughs> um, th- there's there's definitely um, even with just a preponderance, there, there's a there's a sizable portion of folks there, but like the the economic characteristics of that group and the and even some of the social characteristics of, of that group are kind of well documented and well known to be rather homogenous. Mm. Um, so while we'll definitely see the effects of stuff like self checkouts and things, like the the more rural you get right now, the you, you know you can go to grocery stores today still that don't have any self checkouts whatsoever. Right, um, right. And I remember in, in Morris cases, when uh, when they first introduced self checkout lines, everybody was really confused, and that was while I was in college there. So that was like 2014 or something. Oh, for real? Yeah. yeah. And like there, there are places downtown here, for example, like Lunds, where like Lunds doesn't do it, and I. I bet that that is in part like because it is considered like a quote unquote uh, a premium thing to have mm, to have mm-hmm. folks uh, to have a human being bag your groceries for you and ring everything up and you know and simultaneously like I was recently in Painesville, Minnesota where like they just didn't they didn't have them right like it just wasn't a, a consideration for right. the grocery store out there. So yeah, like, but that, the that... yeah the the economic kind of pressures are naturally in the favor of companies that adopt a automation in order to make, uh, you know the the stuff that they sell cheaper. But then we get into kind of the the problem of like, if if most companies out there that are producing all these cheap commodities don't employ any people, like right. how can anybody afford to buy even the cheap stuff if nobody has jobs? So. <laughs> truly, 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 truly. Another really good point that was brought up in um, CGP Gray's Humans Need Not Apply video is that, you know, these these mechanical muscles, as he calls them, don't just apply to, like, what we can do with our bodies, but they also apply to our brain power, you know, so thinking in creative jobs. And, uh, you know, and a lot of people who, you know, like paint or compose music or, or, you know, things like that can make the argument that, like, well, what I do, you know, is is unique and, and can't be replicated by a, a machine. But throughout that video, uh, he had some music in the background that was actually actually composed by an algorithm and in blind tests people can't tell the difference and you know you get into you get into things like Westworld where it's like okay if you can't tell the difference between like a human and a host you know it's it's obviously much cheaper to run like a a uh, a restaurant or something that that doesn't employ people as waitresses but like you know has a bunch of uh a- androids that um that just look like humans you know yeah and so like once we get to the point where you can't tell the difference it's you know what what do we have do we have like made in china type stamps that like you know <laughs> where, where you you have to get certified by the government to say like yeah we employ humans here like pay us more money as a premium just because of you know of the experience of interacting with humans yeah right i mean you're 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 totally on on point here with this there's in a lot of creative professions too a lot a lot of the a lot of the work that's being done kind of has quote unquote has to be done by a human because it takes human like human information like uh human communication and human relationships almost as input right Mm. Um, like for example, uh, in the fringe, we were talking about how there's this, uh, how there are these like marketplaces for inexpensive logo design and a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of the ones that are actually still backed by humans, right? So humans are the ones doing the design, but who will like do work for five bucks or whatever that quote unquote works because, you know, some of these people are design students. Some, some of these folks, uh, just like sign up to, to freelance for, for whatever reason through the site, but like the the value of that work is kind of fixed, say, for example, at a, at a certain price. But what they take as input there is whatever information the person comes through. Whereas like if, if, if that were, there's, there's almost certainly going to be a point where this changes, but in the current state, right? Like if you, if you give a computer input that describes uh, um, something, it can't ideate in the same way a machine learning algorithm can't ideate and fi- like necessarily create something that, that feels, um, that that will necessarily meet that specification or right. or take other arguments to do that. But as even as I'm describing this here, right, even the way that I'm describing this indicates that this is something that machine learning algorithms and neural networks in particular might at some point be able to do because that's all that a, a neural network is or a classifier is is something that 
takes takes human direction, per perhaps through natural language or perhaps through some other sort of mechanism as input, and then applies a bunch of transformations to that and with a lot of goofy stuff that is kind of tricky to understand and tricky to explain briefly, and takes feedback as to whether that was what folks were looking for or not into account as to the many, many other executions of this program against it to, to hopefully eventually arrive at something that humans uh, will accept. We're not there yet, but we very well may be at some point. Now, I did find a very, very interesting uh, article from the New York Times about how unemployment has risen a whole lot in very like specific segments of the population mm -hmm. and, and kind of the effects that that has been having. So... First off, of course, the employment rates. This this is this was written in 2014, by the way. Um, so at that time, employment rates had not risen to pre-recession levels, and it's it, man, it constantly amazes me how much the the recession that happened when we were in high school still right. comes up today. Must have been a doozy, but uh, but I don't remember very well. <laughs> so yeah, so the the article that uh, that we're talking about here from the New York Times deals mainly with prime age men is is what they call them uh, those 25 to 54 years old who have not been working in like the I, th I think it's like the previous 12 months was what they were um, mm -hmm. what they were talking about specifically and the and the proportion of of these men uh, who are not working has risen by a lot and and some reasons for that is that um, it's easier to live without employment um, these days than it, than it used to be. Many of them are like on federal disability benefits. Men are also less likely to be providing for others um, because like marriage rates are down and less of them, a uh, few of them have, uh, you know, families to provide for. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a few like kind of social structures that make it easier to, to live um, without employment. So the, the internet reduces isolation that can result from, you know, not having a workplace that you have to go to and interact with other people on a day-to-day -day basis but it also like provides entertainment right entertainment has become very very cheap uh in today's world just ask anybody who's uh trying to create stuff online and get noticed um you know there's so freaking many of us who are making podcasts these days that uh i have no idea how you found this one <laughs> <laughs> good one but also like these men who aren't like employed employed they can also just kind of find odd jobs every once in a while when they when they do need to um so so like full-time employment is kind of um dis disincentivized no for sure and on the on kind of the flip side prices for things that you need in order to like remain working has increased uh, a lot more than most other things so things like child care because that's very like labor intensive the cost of that has uh has um, risen health care um, you know if you're if you're not working you don't have to keep yourself in like peak physical condition right um, and so you can kind of forego going to the doctor for a checkup uh, as often as you probably would if you know if you were working and you needed to keep yourself healthy and I think another part of this too is like the age of the folks that are mm -hmm. kind of discussed in this article right because it, it describes them as being like kind of 18, 18 to 34 right so that's um folks who generally just as a whole are less likely to seek health insurance <laughs> yeah and then um also like training and higher education for you know to to like get the jobs that actually are in demand um that costs a lot of like time and money as well that you may not have if you uh have not had regular employment in the in the recent past mm -hmm. and also like um we're kind of seeing more and more that uh, on the on the younger end of this uh 25 to 54 range men are tending to stay in school longer um which delays their entry into the workforce but it does increase their chances of getting a higher paying job which is of course why they are doing that we've seen in a lot of industries kind of uh, a shift from having like all of your employees being like full-time employees to employing a lot of contractors and uh, the example that i found of this was the game industry which is not like it's not super transparent most of us who buy video games don't realize that like you know like you might talk about um dice uh you know a, a studio over in sweden right um that uh, oh yeah they're really well known for like making uh you know these these um big uh first person shooters with like lots of destructible environments 
humans, very realistic, you know? Um, and it's like, well, okay, how much of that, like, studio, quote-unquote, is actually, like, the same people who are making from game to game, you know, if they if they are hiring some contractors for one game project and then letting them go and then hiring more people for the next game project, etc. And there's uh, and there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of industries that are kind of shifting towards that model more than more than keeping like all of their employees the the entire time. Yeah, for sure. I, I know we spoke a little bit in the fringe uh, about uh, how the ad industry and, and uh, design and, and tech and creative tech are particularly uh, fields where this is this has been the case, particularly in advertising, essentially since since its inception. It's often the case that folks who do design or even copywriting and certainly programming and creative tech often work on a contract basis. In fact, that's like kind of the formation of an agency in and of itself is that it's a it's a group of people who work as a unit on contract to. Mm. Uh, to a company and so like the the distinction between considering that like a hiring and a firing or hiring and a laying off is that oftentimes these these contracts or these these things are intended to be temporary from the start and even now even today it's often the case that folks almost desire to go independent at a certain point it's almost yeah it's almost like a mark of a mark of seniority in some cases where somebody once they've attained a certain level of of independence right or they or they feel like they want to work on something different something more specialized or something more generalized than the work that they did at a previous full-time position or many previous full-time positions will will quote unquote go indie or go independent and then negotiate contracts independently with particularly in advertising like other agencies the same agency sometimes uh sometimes it's the uh, uh working for the same folks just the same folks and other people or the same folks and under different circumstances and that affords people all sorts of different kind of scenarios as well because yes while you have to manage the economics of it a little bit a little bit better than microeconomics the the taxes the the healthcare has to be kind of done independently too insurance all that stuff but yeah. when you what you get out of it is like this sense of being able to work whenever you want, set your own hours, but it's a lot more of an adversarial relationship than a full-time job. Mm-hmm. And this um, this nicely brings us into the concept of the gig economy, which is, uh, I mean, it's it's not like a brand new concept, but it's kind of come into its own, I would say, uh, in recent years, especially since like online platforms have made it much, much easier for like workers and clients to, you know, get matched with them with each other. And, uh, you know, and because like we have had uh, recent economic harder times um, that, you know, people want to supplement their like their main their main job with, you know, some uh, side hustles. Right. And so a lot of times, yeah, we'll see we'll see people doing like a mixture of traditional employment um, and and uh, working on the side. And this can be everything from like driving for Lyft to like people who um, have you know accumulated uh, some specific skills in like uh, in graphic design or in like audio editing or something like that. Mm-hmm. People hire them on a temporary basis to do like a particular project. Yeah, that's brilliant. And like I, I know people too who use this as a way to do things that like for example they don't they wouldn't otherwise get to do in their work like i uh i know some folks who uh work in in the ad world and who drive lyft when they when they feel like it because like one person just like really loves their car and (laughs) right which which is like kind of a weird thing to say right because Mm -hmm. like when you think of what happens in ubers and lyfts is like usually people are in certain cases intoxicated or whatever and and they they're taking a lift home so that they don't drive but uh-huh. this, this person just like has so much fun driving people around talking to them and like showing off her car which she just adores which is great like that's amazing but it's like a totally different thing from what this person does day to day nine to five and i i can totally get that too because like the, there's a lot um and, and a lot of you know basically every every job nowadays is like fast-paced and and kind of draining in such a way that like even if you love it it's like something that maybe like you don't want to do that same kind of work on the weekends right and that's a very Mm -hmm. reasonable thing thing to do uh but people often people who have like a need for cognition and stuff will will seek other ways to to get that satisfaction right and that that's one of the ways to do it for sure and this, I, I was about to say something that um, actually kind of fits into our next subject pretty sure. nicely, um, which is kind of ways that we have to like rethink our society in order in order for 
uh, a transition to a post scarcity environment to you know to be successful mm-hmm. and and the thing that i was going to say is that it you know it's nice doing like some work that that has to do with podcasting because like podcasting is something that i would do whether i was being paid for or or not right uh mm-hmm. oh look i've been doing this for like five years now and uh, and i you know i haven't gotten paid anything for it um <laughs> and and so like yeah one of the things that that um that I realized is that, you know, currently, like, we have this saying that's, uh, if you're good at something, don't do it for free, right? Yeah. I'm sure that you've heard people saying that. And I think in in order for us to live in a post-scarcity mindset, you would have to kind of flip that around and say, if you wouldn't do this job for free, you shouldn't be doing it at all. Yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. So instead of like trying to turn our our hobbies, the things that we like doing into a form of income, it's like the hobbies in and of themselves are are the goal, right? That's that's the ends. Um and so and and like not having to work in order to support yourself outside of your hobby is is like kind of the like the the purpose of of the society that that we're trying to build here, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there are some pretty big challenges to getting to um, post-scarcity. For one thing, there's this tendency for people to, like, once they have acquired a certain, like, standard of living, because of our, our human psychology, we kind of get used to that and that becomes the new norm, right? And then we kind of set our sights on the next big thing, right? And if if we all kind of keep that trend going then we're not going to be able to achieve this post scarcity because we'll always be trying to like get more and more and more right which is which is not like it is not really possible in a world where where none of us are actually working for the stuff that we're getting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so we kind of we have to kind of find this level of of in terms of the material goods at any rate um we kind of have to find this this level of uh of living that that we're all kind of you know that we they find acceptable and then we kind of have to settle for that and i think that's going to be like one of the biggest challenges in terms of of setting up this society is like will people actually buy into that ideal i don't know i don't know if we can do that part <laughs> right right and it's like how how much of this is a thing that needs to be constructed as something as something distinct from just the 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 mechanistic idea of of that right like how, mm-hmm. how much of this is like a, a mindset shift that we almost have to have to get to gradually as opposed to just like an, an on-off switch um yeah yeah and in addition to like you know setting your own sights on the next big thing for yourself people also tend to kind of judge what they have relative to what everybody else has you know Mm. um so if we're always if we're all always trying to keep up with the joneses then we're all going to be pushing each other to you know kind of like accumulate more and more uh stuff and uh and you know and then it quickly gets out of hand as well so we definitely we have to become okay with just like having the same amount of stuff as everybody else yeah that reminds me too. So uh, a while ago in the Star Tribune, there was an article about uh, a family that is kind of a prominent prominent practitioners of this particular kind of minimalism. It's really interesting. Um, the The article made a big to do about how they they didn't have a couch; they just had one like giant chair. And it's like, well, there there are two people <laughs> living in this house and one dog, so uh-huh. really that that chair is a pretty reasonable thing. But like people in, in don't read the comments but if you read the comments you'll see you'll, <laughs> you'll see what i mean the comments in the star tribune are kind of a cesspool just in general but really like what 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 this is about uh, what minimalism is about and particularly for these folks uh anthony and amy are actually good friends of mine oh interesting yeah like they they make these decisions about like what is important and what helps them do what they want to do and and that like maps really literally to the possessions that they keep around them Mm -hmm. and like this this idea of like being content with us with a certain quote-unquote amount of things is really is really interesting because there are people who are practicing this in in a certain form right now uh very literally about the about the the, their physical possessions and i think this article well if, if you read this alone it's it 
it's kind of a little reductive. And, and as I mentioned, they make a big to do about the couch. <laughs> um, like really what, the, what, that, what that's about is like folks who are kind of thinking already in this mode today, right? Before, before there's yeah. like a, a super massive societal incentive to, to do so. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an incentive that they've almost like discovered in, in and of their own kind of existence. So. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the one of the other things that's going to be challenging is, of course, we can compare what we have to other people in terms of like material goods, but we can also find other ways to differentiate ourselves from others, even in a world where like, you know, it, it, where we're all forced to have the exact same uh, standard of living, mm. you know, because there there's, of course, fame. There is relative success in terms of like uh, social standing, et cetera. You know, um, it, 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 it almost doesn't matter, you know, what what kinds of like differentiating factors you take away from people. People find a way to differentiate themselves from other people, which is kind of sad. But it's yeah, like one of the things that CGP Grey said in, in his video that we referenced earlier was that um, it's impossible to have like a poetry based economy ah. w- which is a, a phrase that refers to you know all, all of these things that are popularity based right in terms of of you know determining whether they are like successful whether they're worthwhile or not you know so by definition you can't have uh you know an, an economy where everybody is just like making creative stuff and trying to sell it to everybody else because like naturally some people will be better at it than others and you know they they will acquire a, a larger following and you know then like then it's still lopsided whether it's yeah whether it's based on money or or you know based on like social standing we kind of we have to train people to not always seek out uh <laughs> you know more and more and more yeah absolutely absolutely um now one article that i read by uh tim o'reilly was had a very very interesting concept in it um, where he said that we may have to transition to like having two different currencies, um, one for buying things that were made by machines, and that currency would you know always be trending towards like the things that you buy for with that currency are going to cost less and less as you know like technology improves and and machines can make things for cheaper and cheaper, and then the other currency would be for buying things that are made by like humans, so not just like physical goods but also you know like yeah entertainment products, uh, you know interacting with with like uh, you know a waiter at a fancy restaurant kind of thing stuff like that and he he did a really clever thing where he kind of divided needs into two different classes in this article those that we needs that we feel no matter what and needs that we feel in relation to those around us so that kind of had to do with the keeping up with the Joneses as well so yeah just dividing the economy into completely separate classes where some things are guaranteed to be like provided to you very easily and other things that you might have to work a little bit to get might solve this whole problem. Yeah, another uh, another thing that we are going to have to kind of wrap our minds around is the fact that like currently people find their their worth right um a large part of like our social standing is based on what job you have whenever you're like introducing yourself to somebody else usually what they ask is like well what do you do what are you you know and and you would answer with whatever your profession is and i i've actually kind of been uh, consciously trying to flip that around you know whenever people ask me what i do i tell them like i'm a podcaster and then you know whether people think that uh, i actually make money at that or not is uh, up to them <laughs> I get you. I get you. Um, but yeah, like we're 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 seeing things like you know unemployment is like a huge detriment to people's mental health, but that effect is actually lessened if the people who are unemployed are surrounded by a whole lot of other people who are also unemployed, right? Mm-hmm. So it kind of goes back into the social norm. If if it's normal for people to not be working, then that then that effect of of um you know, unemployment kind of being depressing is at the very least it's lessened. I don't know if we can completely get rid of that, that sense, uh, you know, that, that your, that your worth is, is lessened by the fact that you aren't contributing, you know, but, um, you know, just like I mentioned with, with the example in Star Trek, like if, if I want to be a pilot, uh, you know, for the Federation, but I actually suck at that, like, <laughs> where do I get myself worth from? Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this is this is probably one of the most like uh, individually emotional things that we're going to have to deal with. I, I like how you pulled in 
that quote that we discussed earlier if you're good at something don't do it for free Mm -hmm. that's absolutely that's absolutely something that i think when when fiscal pressures are kind of alleviated or at least changed Mm -hmm. that's that's another thing that's absolutely linked with this like if i i would definitely still like write code if it if it were not my main job actually that's that's most of how i learned to code was like i i was working and but i kept trying to find ways to to help myself out basically by writing little utilities here and there and here and there and then all of a sudden i found myself doing actual software engineering right and well what do you know yeah right and it's like is that is that because is, is that like the path to to doing that i don't think it is i certainly don't think it is for everyone i don't know if i would even necessarily like recommend it to somebody mm-hmm. yeah and actually what you mentioned about psychology um reminded me of uh this article right here down below Mm. that said that you know it's it's kind of dealing with the paradox of like free time and how the promise of you know like hard work was that uh you know you you work hard you accumulate some wealth and then you have you know enough wealth to have some free time right Mm. but what we're seeing uh, at least in the in the current day is that the the rich people who are supposed to be able to afford all of their free time they spend all of their time working, uh, you know, in order to like accrue more wealth. And the people who are actually, you know, having a whole lot of leisure time on their hands are uh, very, very poor people who like aren't uh, consistently employed. And so, so this article was trying to kind of delve into that whole issue of, of why is this? And, um, Ah, this is the one that dealt with um, young men who uh, have not worked in the last year. Mm. So in 2015, 22% of men aged 21 to 30 um, without a college degree had not worked in the last year. And um, the things that they actually did instead was um, a lot of them spent a lot of time playing video games, which is uh, definitely something that I could have predicted. (laughs) Right. But but what what you probably could not have predicted was that these men are reporting a higher satisfaction than the same age group did um, back when employment was higher, which is a very, very interesting um, statistic. And at the same time, the very rich have reduced their leisure time. And one theory about why that is, is that building wealth to them is a creative process in and of itself. And so it's like, it's it's basically what they do for fun. Um <laughs> And, and, you know, when I think about the people who are in this, uh, in this podcast network, the Nexus, you know, like Ryan, uh, when he first got his job, he was working like 24 seven, it seemed like, Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and he was just like printing money, but of course he's not like using a whole lot of that money, uh, at, you know, at, not at the same rate as he's accumulating it at any rate. Right. Yeah. But he, but yeah, he was working so much because he enjoyed the work because that's the kind of person that he is. Right. And so it's not necessarily that he would be doing that work and staying at the office until 9 PM if he weren't getting paid, but he would definitely probably be pursuing that kind of, that kind of challenge um, that he finds in, in his workplace, whether he was being paid to do it or not. Yeah, for sure. I think I, I made a reference earlier to this like psychological concept called need for cognition. It's like this thing where like people almost like, like they, while well, they feel like a need to think, right. And like, if you mm-hmm. find a pattern of thinking that is interesting to you or, or novel or something worth investigating or something that really like um, piques your interest, right? Like it can be really hard to, um, to put that down, right? Just right. like, just like a good book. Uh, it's exactly like a good book. Right. Um, and that's the thing as, as you know, that I run into all the time when your work is something that you love and particularly it's something that causes you to think in a way that you don't otherwise, a way that you don't otherwise think day to day, it can be really hard to do that. I, I joke with my coworkers sometimes that um, I, I, I have trouble leaving places, but really I have trouble leaving places when I'm like in a thinking mode, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because I'm just going to keep thinking. I'm just going to keep working on the same problem because it is in my brain and it's going to annoy me if I can't, if I can't address it. Yeah. And uh, you're actually witnessing the product of my own need 
uh, for thinking um, because I like if, if I encounter a fascinating concept, I'll start a, a document. Uh, I will start seeking out uh, articles and you know videos and stuff that that explain it, and uh, and I'll and I'll write down notes about it, and then I will uh, you know convince some poor sap to sit down with me for an hour or more uh, and talk about it. <laughs> no, I totally get that. I that exact same thing here, right? It's it's all about the way that we process the things that are going on around mm-hmm. us, among other things. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, I'm I'm always happy to talk uh, particularly about stuff like this because i think one of the one of the best things that we can do as 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 people who are observing this stuff is react to it and and think about uh think about how we're reacting to it and talk about how we're reacting to it so this is Mm -hmm. my pleasure um, one of the fascinating things from that article w- that they said was that entertainment is now an inferior good. And an inferior good is, is just, uh, it doesn't mean that it's actually like worse than other goods. Um, that's just an economic concept that sa- says that uh, as one's income goes up, um, you're going to consume less of that good. And that, wow, I, I was not expecting that. But I guess it makes sense because uh, I've, I've witnessed, you know, so many high school students who spend a heck of a lot of their time, you know, consuming stuff on youtube and you know and you might attribute that to like uh you know it speaks to them it's you know it's right up their alley but also i think the fact that they are high school students they do not have like a a significant income and what is youtube it is free you know and so they are they're consuming what they actually have access to what they can Mm -hmm. and uh, you know as as you kind of increase your income a little bit you might pay for a netflix subscription you know um and that kind of fulfills the same needs um and as you you know go up and up and up you might transition from you know netflix from you know from watching tv shows and stuff to doing other things with your time that you know you find fulfilling right and one thing that i actually haven't come to a good satisfying conclusion in my own mind yet that we're going to have to kind of restructure is education and what education is going to mean in a world where we don't have to do work because currently our educational system is definitely structured around the the idea that you're getting this education in order to get the skills necessary to gain employment and when that's not needed anymore do we need education i i should like to think that we do because i think that it's very important for you know the general population to be knowledgeable um and have some critical thinking skills right and so like what what do we do with our educational system in a in a world like that absolutely well like the first thing i i thought of immediately is as we started discussing this is that we need to focus on the other aspects of what it means to be a member of society Right. Mm-hmm. So if, if 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 the goal of education is then not to create not to create people who can work, it's like what are the other aspects of what 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 are the other aspects of society that people need to know about in order to in order to partake? And I think part of that has to be an education on, on what education is, right? And what, what it's there to do. Because mm-hmm. you're right, many people do think about that. I had a I had an economics teacher actually in in high school who had said that more than just preparing you for work school is about like talking like just describing to you and passing down all this knowledge about how these systems work and like you can you can take and do with that whatever whatever you will whether that's like a a passion for public service or activism or you know whether you're whether you find issues with with these systems as they're described and, and you want to figure out a whether that's actually the way they work or not or whether there's like a a, a disconnect between what you were taught and how things behave in reality or whether you want to change the systems as they exist like that's th- those are things this this like understanding of of governance and this understanding of society as we know it um, mm-hmm. and this capability to do something about it i think that's that's what school that's what education would really pivot to because yeah. like, it's no longer like and that was a that was like a duality that I really felt when I when I was going through high school and college because I was fascinated by political science and by economics. Um, I was not as interested in math, right? Like I I mean I I did well enough at math, but I was not it was really painful for me. Like it was really difficult for me to even if nothing else just like uh emotionally or cognitively to wrap my mind around it or to, or to complete math assignments accurately in one sitting so like i think that i'm working in a rather math intensive field now 
should indicate that I yeah. decided to focus on a thing that was I was also passionate about, but also was like a, pragmatically a thing that is more kind of in line with what I wanted to do for work as opposed to like I, I didn't really want to do public administration as my work, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, what like what what kinds of things in a post scarcity society would, you know, we have to teach everybody in order for them to be like effective members of society. I have no idea what the requirements of a society like that are yet. So like designing and implementing an educational system in a world like that is, uh, well, at least transitioning our current one, current educational system to that world is going to be a huge challenge, I'm Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, on the economic side of things, some of the ways that we can uh, help ease the transition um, to a post-scarcity society is, well, for one, we kind of have to make it into a norm that, you know, our, our work weeks are going to be shorter, right? Mm -hmm. But also that uh, we need to start, like, compensating people irrespective of what they you know what they are doing in terms of employment right and one and one of the big subjects uh of uh, the last couple of years is universal basic income um it's been gaining a whole lot of attention so this is the concept where um everybody gets a monthly payment probably from the government no questions asked regardless of who they are regardless of you know what they're doing probably probably every adult um right probably not uh <laughs> not every individual human being like one possible implementation of that is kind of like the way that we do like child tax credits and stuff right now right like if, if yeah. somebody is the is the guardian of 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 a of somebody under 18 maybe maybe like that payment is still issued to them but is like uh yeah I, and, then, and then you open up a whole other can of worms of like how, how does this need to work so that you can minimize like potentially problematic situations where like people are not like are not providing for the children and stuff but that's like a whole other problem that we still have today like that's not a new problem right that's a that's an existing one and also as, as we mentioned uh you know if our goal is to have a long-term post-scarcity society we have to reduce our population growth as well so like mm -hmm incentivizing having children by just like literally paying for the children is not a good idea either. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. So there are like several different models on how exactly to run a universal basic income system. You know, some of them um, are are called like a, a negative income tax where like everybody's given this this pension from the government, but then like, uh, you know, the, the higher your income is, the you know the the higher percentage of your income is is taxed and so like you know as you get higher and higher then then the basic income that you receive from the government is is kind of recouped back to the government kind of thing yeah for sure and that's and that's a you know a, a model that was proposed by oh who is he libertarian uh, economist um Fre friedman some uh, yeah milton friedman milton friedman yeah not, not um, the other guy not the one who works for the new york times <laughs> um, the other one and and there's kind of a few different motivations behind universal basic incomes um you know the one that that i'm coming at it from is of course the concept that automation is going to make uh all of us obsolete in the workforce and so universal basic income is a possible solution to that by decoupling uh, people's economic value from the labor that they provide mm -hmm. and that's that's the reason that most ceos in uh in silicon valley are are interested in the concept as well you know as a way of like kind of getting around these systems that they they themselves are creating that are putting people out of work yeah um, absolutely yeah so so kind of as a result there's like this strange assortment of support for the idea from both like the left and the right sides of of the political spectrum but they're kind of like for very different reasons and usually support like different implementations of it in particular i think it's really funny that that one of the concerns that people have with the concept of universal base, universal basic income is that uh well you know people who receive this benefit will not have any incentive to work anymore and i'm like e yeah, that's the point. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's this like outmoded idea that like people people need to work in order to feel uh in order in order to feel actualized, which is like mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous. It's like th then the the issue is the the issue is the idea 
and not the uh, not even really the execution. It's the it's the thought that people have in their minds that they need to be giving their labor to some other entity. Well, and not even necessarily themselves, but also just like the why are they getting the help when they're not doing any work? You know, exactly, exactly, um, right? The, yeah. Yep, that's a great point. That's a great point because it usually is directional like that and it's usually mm-hmm. not uh, reflexive for sure. And yeah, and hopefully like hopefully that that type of sentiment is kind of reduced by the fact that literally everybody is getting this money, you know. Mm-hmm. So for example, I went to the U of M Morris where the the school's history is, you know, it used to be like a boarding school for Native American children and then and then it became like an agricultural school and then it was sold to the University of Minnesota. And part of the stipulation of it being sold to the U of M was that Native American students must always have free tuition at this school. Mm-hmm no matter what. And I definitely admit that when I first started going to the U of M, I was a little miffed about that. I was like, you know, well, why do they, you know, the capital T, they get to go to school for free, but I don't. And, and, you know, that's like, it's very, very easy to kind of get into this mindset of like in group, out group, you know, like people who are like me versus people who are not like me and people who are like me deserve, you know, what, you know, good things to come to them because like I'm a good person. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, but yeah, like if sure. we ha- if we have this world where literally everybody is getting this basic income, uh, hopefully that kind of sentiment is, is reduced. Yeah, for sure. Right. And then like the, there are other components to this, too, that are like a whole other episode and a half many many more thereafter uh, Mm -hmm. about like how how do we how do we make sure this is equitable not just equitable in terms of uh individual earnings but equitable socially and culturally and like for the kind of uh for for the atrocities that are committed by for example the united states government uh and other governments as well yeah history right like how, how can we use this as a tool to combat income inequality in general right um, mm-hmm. over time yeah yeah uh and that's you and know. uh yeah and and yeah one of the one of the other reasons for trying to in- implement a universal basic income is to just like straight up eliminate poverty right mm-hmm. and to that end kind of th- there have been a few experiments done with universal basic incomes where they're trying to test and see whether it, it you know works on a large scale or not and uh one that that's you know currently going on is a, a non-government organization called give directly has chosen a bunch of villages in rural kenya and they basically you know came in and they just announced that hey every adult in this village is going to get uh, 22 dollars a month for the next 12 years and we're just going to see what happens and uh, and the the article also gets into you know some more specifics about like why just giving cash directly instead of like trying to give material goods is a much better charity. But also uh, it's being done yeah as as this kind of test of of UBI to see uh, do people just kind of sit idly by and try to live off of this twenty two dollars a month or you know do they take that and apply it to like entrepreneurial endeavors or you know like um, do they use it for education for their kids you know um and and of course because this is such a long-term kind of study it's it's going to take a while for the results to come in yeah Mm -hmm. but uh i did i did kind of take that number that 22 dollars a month and adjusted it um according to like the the poverty line in in rural kenya versus like the poverty line here in minnesota Mm -hmm. and that that's a roughly equivalent to giving everybody in in uh minnesota like a thousand dollars per month right so could could I use uh, an extra thousand dollars a month? Heck yeah, I could. Uh, thank you very much. I would appreciate that very much. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's like uh, in in many areas in Minneapolis and St. Paul too. I believe that's around or a little bit over the um, the uh, median rent. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I yeah. Just, and, and as you move further away from uh, from downtown, that's well well above the median the median rent, which is like that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Now, as this pertains to, uh, you know, using UBI as kind of a solution for automation is, of course, like, you know, giving giving right around the poverty line is not going to be enough in, you know, the long term when, you know, when most people are not working. But I think it's kind of a good it's a good start, you know, to, like to kind of start the transition. Right. Where where most people can. 
uh, live off of a combination of like that basic income and then either, you know, whatever side hustles they can scrounge up or, um, you know, or they use that money to kind of um, prolong the amount of time that they take to search for a job, right? And re thus resulting hopefully in, in them finding a, a better job that's more suited to themselves, um, you know, or they take that money and they invest it in their own education or something like that, you know? So I think, I think it's just like, it seems to be a good a good starting point in this process of of trying to transition into a post scarcity society and of course that's a that's making the assumption that a post scarcity society is what we want you know because of course some people are going to really not like the sound of you know in order to achieve this post scarcity society we have to slow down economic growth you know and and pull back on uh, you know on all this this stuff that we are buying right and and make do with with a reasonable amount of of you know goods but like not always trying to get more and more and more so it's yeah it's uh, Convincing people that uh, that this is a desirable outcome is is honestly like the first step, um, right? <laughs> and uh, so I hope that us us making this uh, podcast episode is uh, kind of contributing to that because I definitely think that a post scarcity society sounds very appealing. Right. I think I think you're right that there are a lot of hurdles though on the um, for for people who are really um, entrenched in benefiting in or even just feel like they're benefiting from and may, may not actually be benefiting from a, a system where scarcity is prevalent across a number uh, a number of resources i think mm -hmm. a thing that we have to kind of kind of come to terms with as a society is maybe not only whether this is a good thing or not or whether it's a desirable thing or not but whether it's a thing we can stop even if we wanted to and i think mm. uh I think that will take some time, but I think uh, I totally agree with you. The alternative would be far, far less preferred, and discussing the alternative would be one heck of another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, like this idea yeah. where like people, like we have artificial limits on things for the for the purposes of like creating this the simulation of growth, um, and like this is a thing that happens in Ponzi schemes, and this is a thing that happens in destructive cults all over all over the world. So like is do, hmm. Is that really the thing we want to emulate? Uh, I, I will leave that to you, to your listener. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about it on another podcast because that yeah. is a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and on, on the one thing that I would like to say about continual growth is that we, we, we won't be able to keep that up for forever. You know, we, we're going to run into the constraints of um, how much energy, you know, our planet and our sun can support. And, you know, we're like... Uh, we can't rely on colonizing, you know, the entire universe to solve that problem because, you know, there are constraints in terms of how fast we can go. And so there's there's actual like we cannot visit the entire universe because we cannot fast travel faster than the speed of light. So like our local cluster is the only one that we've got and um, etc. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, man, this has been quite quite the uh, episode thank you for sticking with us this far if you have any feedback for us on you know any of the many things that we brought up this episode or uh, if you would like to pitch an idea for a future episode of the extra dimension to us feel free to get in touch with us you can email us at the nexus tv at gmail.com or find us on twitter at the nexus tv i have been ian r buck you can find me on twitter as ian r buck and I'm Brandon Johnson. You can find me on Twitter as Brandon underscore MN. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. Yeah, take care.